For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the, the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. Well, good morning, uh, Westminster Chapel, uh, preaching again from Bournemouth to you, sending you our love and it can't wait to be back with the church in London. And we're continuing in our series in Ephesians today. And I want you to use your imagination and imagine that the world we're living in is could be summed up on a plate and on that plate, you'd want to draw or to write your hopes, your dreams for yourself, for your life, for your children's life, and maybe for the seven and a half billion people who live on the planet. What would you be painting or writing and drawing in terms of your hopes and your ambitions? These pictures represent a whole ton of stuff. We would want vaccination for the whole world, wouldn't we, from this COVID crisis? We'd want freedom, freedom of people movement, freedom of religion, freedom for people to live their lives in the way they want. We'd want to see uh, an end to knife crime, end to rampant nationalism, uh, people trafficking. We'd want to think about food and want all the world to be fed and be able to have a wonderful meal every day of their lives. We would want climate change to see a change in that and the endangered species we want to make sure everybody had money uh, to be able to buy the essentials of life we'd want to make sure that everybody was being properly cared for but the reality is very different represented by this hammer one billion slum dwellers live in the world today. The rich are getting richer. They say that 1% of the world's wealthiest people own 50% of the world's wealth. There are 140 million orphans in the world today. 80 million displaced people. 45,000 knife crimes in the world today. George Floyd, Black Lives Matter in our day, Brexit, the breaking up, our nation split down the middle. Covid, how the nation split over Covid to vaccinate, to not vaccinate, to stay in or not to stay in. Our world, like this plate, is in tatters. And what is it that can bring us together again. What is it that unites us is our study to this morning, hope embodied. Hope, I'm calling it in a new humanity called the church. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Brexit Britain sat on a wall. Covid came knocking, we've had a great fall. All the best women 
and all the best men cannot bring our nation together again. But there is a group of people that are called by God to draw the nation together. Unity and diversity to show the world what God always wanted for this world from the beginning. And that's our study this morning. So we're going to look at hope embodied in a new humanity, which is the church. And we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 11 through to 16. And it'd be really helpful if you can follow this very closely in your Bibles so that you get the full impact of what Paul is trying to address for the church in the first century, but indeed for the church today. And the first thing I want us to see, there's only two uh, points in this sermon, is, is the brokenness and hopelessness of a broken humanity. The hopelessness of a broken humanity. Paul says, therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, brackets, which is done in the body by human hands, Remember, at that time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. You couldn't put it more bleakly in terms of the Gentile position. But not only were they alienated, the Gentiles alienated from God, they were alienated too from Jews, the Jew and the Gentile, hated each other. They despised each other. Anti-Semitism is nothing new. The Jews looked down upon the Gentiles. They saw them as uncircumcised. They saw them as lost. They saw them as sinners. They saw them as people who were um, under God's judgment. And the Gentiles would, would also look upon the Jews and see them as religious bigots, zealots, people who were irrelevant to their society, people who wore strange clothes and needed to be excluded from them. So there was this hostility between the two groups. And these two groups were what made up the church. As God's gospel was received into a town, into a city like Ephesus, and this letter was a circular letter right across Asia Minor. So Paul wanted the church to understand that the, these hostilities uh, existed historically, and now in Christ they needed to come to an end. But for them to come to an end, Paul had to remind them, he says here, therefore remember Christians often have to be told to remember. In remembering, it helps us to understand more clearly what the gospel has achieved in our lives. Remember your previous condition, previous to God's action, previously to when you were drawn near by Christ, but now in Christ, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Paul is wanting to emphasise what the gospel achieved in terms of bringing Jew and Gentile together through the blood of Christ into this wonderful new community. That God had broken down the dividing walls of hostility. It says here in verse 14, He himself is our peace who has made the two groups, Jew and Gentile, one, and destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility, we can think of even the Gentile that wanted to draw near, even the Gentile that wanted to come to the temple and to be part of that community, how they were excluded. There was a court of the Gentiles. There were walls that were built. They were not allowed to go into the heart, into the innermost sanctums of the temple. They were always foreigners. They were always excluded. There were always dividing walls of hostility between them. And only as they remembered what Christ achieved through the gospel. Only then could unity in God's church start to be understood of what 
God had accomplished. Only then could they worship together as one body and see together what Christ's blood has achieved in reconciling not only Jew and Gentile to God, but in Jew and Gentile together. Creating in himself, verse 15, one new humanity. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. This is a huge issue for us today as we look at our broken world and think of ourselves being the hope to this world, bringing hope to this world and bringing the glue that can bind communities back together. The Church of Jesus Christ can be full of the same divisions we find in the world, and that should not be. I wonder if I'm speaking today to people who have been damaged or broken, feel like the shards of that plate because of brokenness in your family. A father who's left, a family that's broken apart and you feel damaged and alone. I wonder if there are people who feel nationality is something that divides them from people in the church. We've been reminded very, very importantly with the George Floyd incidents that actually there is colour blindness that exists right across the Western world. And the church has got to be the agency to not only highlight that, but to bring about one new humanity, to show the world what God can do through the gospel. And there is a lot of work to do. Brothers and sisters, the playing field has been uneven for years. And to level it up is going to take action and prayer and preference and redistribution of wealth in order to see the beautiful church of Jesus Christ showing the world what God means in one new man in Christ. Think of money, think of class, how the church, Westminster Chapel, can be divided by class. I can remember when I was in Bournemouth, uh, somebody coming from a working class background, and after the service, a middle class person came to me and said, we're getting too many of that kind of person. The church has become very middle class. And we can think we, this is a nice club. We, we all like the same things. We all uh, drink at the same bars and like the same coffee and go to the same theatres or cinemas. But actually, that's not what the church is there to do. The church is there to demonstrate to the world, one new humanity in Christ, what the gospel can achieve for us. Think of the division of male and female. Think of the division with um, the whole area of uh, sports. Even to the most simple thing of football teams that we follow can be a reason for not talking to someone or despising someone. And if that brokenness is between us and fellow members of the church, actually that brokenness is there in our own lives too. That actually we don't even like ourselves a lot of the time. One in four people in this current lockdown have had issues or challenges with their mental health. I'm amazed it's that low. I'm surprised it's not three in four or four in four, to be honest. So we're living in a broken world and we're coming out of that broken world into this beautiful new community called the church. And Paul wants the, the Christians to remember what they were in order to embrace what they've now become in Christ. If we try and unify the world through man-made institutions, through man-made agreements, through politics or through religion, we just rebuild the Tower of Babel, which is doomed for judgment. But there is hope for the world. There is hope in terms of one hu new humanity. And that humanity, that body, that group of people, that citizenship is called the local church. So the second point in this sermon is God's powerful superglue to create a new humanity. It says in verse 14, 
For he himself, that's Christ himself, is our peace, who has made the two groups, Jew and Gentile, one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to you who are near. Paul, throughout the book of Ephesians, wants us to understand the power of God. I wonder, listening to me this morning, if you're saying, Guy, I need power in my family. I need power in my life. I need power in my emotional health today. I need power in terms of loving the church as, as, as Jesus wants me to love Westminster Chapel. Well, Paul in Ephesians is showing this power in three distinct ways. Firstly, he shows it to us in the powerful resurrection of Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, verse 19, it says, um, And his incomparably great power for us who believe, that power is the same as his mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. We think of Jesus, uh, dead body, buried in a tomb, and that power that came where cells and hearts and everything's reconstituted, rebuilt, re restarted again, a new resurrection body as Jesus burst forth from that tomb. That power of God, incomparable to anything else on earth. But that power is also seen in us, the resurrection of us. Us who were dead, for cha chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. We were dead, dead as a doornail. We brought nothing to the party. We did not climb ourselves into God's presence. We didn't wave our hands. We didn't do something religiously good that God noticed us and came looking for us. No, we were dead, spiritually dead to God, his existence, his word, his spirit, and God came looking for us. God called us. God resurrected us and gave us eternal life. The power of God that makes us Christians. But thirdly, and one I believe we so often neglect as believers, very much in the West we've neglected this truth, this power is also in bringing about something powerful on earth. And that is the new humanity or the local church, the powerful body of Christ incarnate in the world today. We are the body of Christ. He is the head, but we are his body. It says in, in chapter 122, God placed all things under Jesus' feet and appointed him to be head over everything. What for? For the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So we are, in our togetherness, the body of Christ to the world outside in London, in Westminster and where we live. See, many, I, I think, today have been wrongly taught or fallen into this trap of believing that the power of God is just in our salvation, that we are taught well believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and that's the that's the deal you get your ticket you get your insurance document you will enter into his eternal premises now live as you like Christ called us to follow him to deny ourselves to take up our cross it says in Luke 14 any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple you see all the dividing things that divide us all our badges of effort, our religious pedigree, our middle classness, our money, our education, our finance, our football team, our colour of skin, everything that divides us. Jesus says we renounce all that in order to follow him. 
The gospel is the same for Jew and for Gentile. We bring nothing of our effort to the salvation work. Jesus has done it all. It says in verse 13 here, we have all, everyone, Jew, Gentile, rich, poor, male, female, black, white, we have all been brought near by the blood of Christ. I've got a confession to make. If you watch the video very carefully at the very beginning of this video, as I hit that plate with a hammer, I um, cut my finger. And you'll notice if you watch carefully that I look down on the floor thinking, hang on, how come there's blood splattering on the floor as I'm doing this video? Breaking plates, you get little shards and blood was shed in order for you to benefit in this video. But how much more, brothers and sisters, do we need to recognise that blood was shed in order for us to be reconciled to God, but also reconciled to each other? We are a blood-bought people. Christ, the hound of heaven, brought us near through his blood, through his finished work upon that cross. He brought us near and brought us into his family and into the Father's presence. Therefore, there is no boasting. This is the, the power of God in us, that we can be united as a church. We can prefer one another and build the body of Christ and build this incredible community on earth because we dare not claim any pedigree, any sense of preferential treatment, any sense of us and them, any sense of better than. No, we are humbled by God's grace that we have been reconciled through his blood into this new humanity, this hope-filled humanity, the local church. So let me conclude this message. I believe two things that God wants to do this morning as you listen to this message. The first one is this, I believe if you are not a Christian, or you're a backslidden Christian, or you're a person who's believed and felt that Christianity was just about getting your ticket and now you're living a sin-filled life and church is irrelevant to you, I believe God is seeking you and wanting to draw you this morning to himself. I believe his Holy Spirit is knocking at the door of your heart. He's asking you to come in he wants to break down the dividing walls the way you built a wall and said I'm never going to go to church I'm never going back to that church I'm never going to trust that person again I don't like that church leader he's breaking down those walls and he's saying I want you to be joined and committed and connected to the body of Christ joined to the head if you've never become a Christian today I urge you with all my heart blood has been spilt it has been shed for your sin in order for you to be reconciled or brought back into relationship with the living God. But I also want to speak to many of us who have been Christians maybe many, many years who still have walls of division in our life. When I think of the world out there, there are famous walls that speak of histories of hostility, of warfare, of division, of us and them, of hatred and betrayal and murder. Think of the Great Wall of China. Think of the Berlin Wall. Think of the wall that was built in Belfast to separate Catholic and Protestant. Think of the wall, walls even in London that uh, were built to keep marauding forces at bay. And God's wrecking ball is moving this morning as we listen to his word and as we think about his world he wants to break down in us the dividing walls of hostility feelings of racism feelings that we, we would almost be embarrassed to admit to one another feelings of sexism feelings of uh, of elitism that we are somehow slightly more educated people who feel that they're better than others God wants to break that down in us and he wants us members of Westminster Chapel to give ourselves fully 
to his work fully to not just the elders but fully to each other i don't believe we've seen anything like the power of god being released amongst us that he wants to do in building this wonderful church but i believe the commitment that it takes is a is a commitment like we give to our spouse on the day of our wedding for richer or poorer, for better or worse, in sickness or in health. We're not walking away from each other. We're not being casual about church attendance. We're giving ourselves to what God is giving himself to, which is building the local church. Because the local church, ha it has no equal on earth. There is no power on earth like it when it's working well together, when it's working in, in obedience to the word of God and, 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 the, and the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm calling us and urging us today to, to pull together. We will come out of this crisis and I want us to come out and I, I believe we will come out stronger, more committed together, more understanding that we are to be a, a display of God's power and reconciliation in our togetherness. So I'm going to pray now for the Holy Spirit to go to work. I'm going to ask that you would examine your life and look if there are dividing walls. If you are loving what God loves, if you're giving yourself to what God's giving himself to and pray that you wouldn't be left outside. You wouldn't be feeling an us and them today, but you would be feeling a wonder of the grace of God, filling a filling of hope. Hope filled for our church in our future, but hope filled for what God's going to do in our lives in terms of bringing many others to be reconciled with him and breaking down those dividing walls of hostility. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would come now by your spirit. I pray where there are any hatreds in our heart towards another group, another person, where there's breakdown in our family, where we hate our mum or our dad or brother or sister where there's been unforgiveness for years I pray where there's been hurt and pain caused by abuse I pray Lord you would come now tenderly by your spirit and break in there I pray Lord where we have taken Westminster Chapel for granted and our attendance is nominal I pray break that dividing wall of hostility in our mind. Help us to give ourselves to each other in a way we've never done before. And Lord, if there's dividing walls uh, between groups of people in the church and us and them, people who have been better educated or, or feel their lack, I pray again, Father, in these days ahead, would you bring about a beautiful community in London of many, many nations. I pray for 30, 40, 50 nations in one body. I pray for leaders that are represented in BAME all across the, 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 the breadth of our church. And I pray, Lord, that we would bring reconciliation right across the city, wherever we work, wherever we live, that, Lord, we know we've received grace, amazing grace. And may we extend that and give that to others, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.